All right, uh, let's get started. Today we'll talk about um, trees, forests, and ensembles. So trees and forests are one of the most popular machine learning models, and uh, they're quite commonly used. And so I want to start, about, uh, um, start with uh, why do we want to use trees? What are the benefits? So one of the main benefits is that they are nonlinear, so they can model very complex relationships. As I said earlier in the lecture, they are um, basically a non-parametric model, which means they can uh, grow to be as complex as necessary for any given data set. So it's uh, possible to learn anything uh, with a decision tree. Tree-based models are probably the most popular uh, class of models in industry, uh, possibly only uh, competing with neural networks. One of the other great advantages of trees is that they really don't care a lot about um, how you pre-process your data. We'll talk about how these trees are built uh, soon, but they don't care about the scale of the data, and they don't care about monotonous um, transformations of the data. So doing something like the power transformation, like the box clocks that we saw before, this just doesn't matter, the tree will not change. And it's great if you are invariant with respect to these things because it means you don't need to care about these pre-processing uh, things at all. Another reason why uh, some people argue trees are nice is because they're interpretable, because you can sometimes print out uh, like the model and uh, show it to your boss. It's very hard to do that with a neural network. Uh, depending on the size of the tree, that's not really true in practice, though. All right, so let's start with uh, decision trees for classification. So the idea is that you want to ask a series of binary questions. So here's like a cartoon version of this. Assume you want to distinguish uh, four different animals, and you can start asking uh, binary questions like, does it have feathers? Depending whether, whether or not, you can ask a different question, say, can it fly, whether or not, and if it's true, it's hawk, if it's false, it's a penguin. Um, so basically, you want to um, ask binary questions, and depending on what the answers were before, you want to ask other follow-up questions. And the goal in decision tree learning is to ask these kind of binary decision rules from the data set. So here's an example in, in 2D um, using this like two moons data set where we want to classify the blue points versus the red points and let's say these are both our training sets. And so now the kind of binary questions that we can ask in decision trees usually is, is feature i greater than a given threshold? So here there's two features, the x-axis and the y-axis, like say feature one, feature two. And I can ask, is feature one greater than the given value? And I can ask this for any possible value. And this is a binary question. And uh, the decision tree actually basically brute force looks at all possible questions. So it looks at, iterates over both features and then over all possible thresholds. The only thresholds that really matter are those where there's a value in the data point. So um, if I set a threshold here or anywhere further on, it doesn't matter, the answer will always be the same. So basically you go through all uh, possible thresholds for all possible features and you ask how much information will this give me about the classification outcome? How well does this separate the red from the blue points? And I'll go into more detail about how this happens in a second. So now let's assume I found that this line here is the best way to separate the uh, red points from the blue points. So here, the threshold on a feature means it's an axis parallel um, hyperplane, basically, that you're learning. So here, th um, this question is, is x1 uh, less equal to 0 0.0596? And if this is true, then you're in this bottom and you're probably a red point. If it's false, you're in the top and you're probably a blue point. The counts here are how many samples there are from each class. So in this 
top node here in the tree represents the whole data set, and there's 50 red and 50 blue points. And so in the bottom, there's two blue and 32 red points. In the top, there's eight, uh, 48 blue and 18 red points. So now that I've found um, this first binary question, this first threshold, I can iterate this. Um, trees, as you know, are often built in a recursive fashion. So now I can look at just this top section here. And for this top section, I can try again all features and all thresholds. And I can find the best binary, uh, sorry, the best uh, yes, no question to uh, further separate blue from red points. And so here in the top region, um, which I said was this node, the question that we found is, is x0 uh, smaller or equal to 1.1957, which is this line here. And uh, if so, then you're in this area. If not, you're in this area. And similarly, for the bottom, we also ask what is the next best question we can ask, and um, we found we find this here, which is is x zero less equal than minus zero point four one seven seven, and if so, then uh, you're in this region, and you're blue probably. If not, you're in this region. You're probably red. You can then, so uh, recursively, do this for all the regions. And you can do this until all the regions are what's called pure. Pure means there's only a single value in them. So this region, these two regions at the bottom, they're already pure. You can see this here. There's like two blue points in this area, and there's 32 red points in this area. So there's clearly in this area, there's no more possible questions we can ask that tell us more about the classification outcome because all the points in this area are the same class. For these areas up here, we can keep um, splitting the area up uh, until all, basically until we have regions that are small enough that they're all pure. And you can see the uh, results here. This is a tree of depth nine. I only show part of it here. And so now this is, has uh, split up the plane into regions that are all pure. So. In this tree, so each node corresponds to a binary question or a threshold on a feature. And um, each leaf corresponds to what's called a terminal region, which is um, basically an area in the input space. So you, you partition the area in the input space, and each of these uh, areas corresponds to one of the leaves of the tree. If you do this, until all the leaves are pure, so until you can't split any further. You can see here, this is uh, probably uh, overfit quite a bit. So uh, you probably wouldn't call points that are up here red. And here's like a very tiny slice of blue that's kind of weird. And so uh, we'll also talk in a little bit about um, how we can restrict the growth of trees. So for classification, there's two main criteria that are used to measure um, what's called the impurity of a node. These are Gini index and cross entropy. And um, so cross entropy is basically just the entropy of the class labels in the in a given node, and the Gini index is well. You can see the formula. So basically, you, for both of these, you sum over all. So you can compute this for uh, the observations in a given node. And you, you sum this, uh, these probabilities over all of the classes. And these will be, uh, you want to maximi maximize these. These will be high if everything is just one class. Wait. No, these are impurities, sorry. You want to minimize these. It's, yes. So you want to minimize these. Um, so these will be uh, low if everything is of one class. 
And so you, uh, for each possible split, you look at um, how much will uh, either the Gini index or the cross entropy decrease if I split this uh, node into two nodes. So you look at the sum of the uh, two nodes that would, um, would be created if you split this node using a different threshold, and you pick the threshold in the feature that, that decrease the impurity as much as possible. But basically, this is the way to formalize to say, how much does it tell me, does this split tell me about the classification outcome? Okay, so the question is, what is PM? So it's the, um, it's the distribution over classes, or it's the empirical distribution of, uh, over the training set of uh, over the classes in node M. So yes, it's the fraction of points that belong to this class. So here it would be 50-50. Here it would be 48%, uh, no, sorry. 96% and, well, I can't, I can't do this in my head. <laughs> um, never mind. Well, <clears throat> yes. Cool. All right, so now let's say we built a tree. Let's say here we stopped at, um, the, uh, at depth two, so we, d we uh, only have four terminal regions or four leaves, and so now, Oh no. Okay, sorry. Um, so now if I have a new data point, the way I classify the data point is uh, I just basically ask all these questions in order. So for my new data point, I check is x1 uh, less equal than 0 0.0596. If yes, I go to the left. If no, I go to the right. And then if I go to the left, then I ask is x0 um, less or equal than this number. If yes, I go to the left. If no, I go to the right. And then I predict the class that is most common in a leaf node. So basically, I just traverse the tree, uh, go left and right, and then I, for a new data point, I predict the majority class. We can do the same uh, game for regression, and it works basically exactly the same way. The prediction for regression is just the mean in the leaf, and um, the criteria for splitting are usually either the mean squared error or the mean absolute error. So what this means is that you look at the split and you look at, um, if I compute the mean after the split in the two nodes separately and I use these as predictions, how much better will this be than if I don't do the split? And uh, again, you f find a split that gives you the most information about the regression target. So, as I said, you can visualize these trees. We already saw some of them. Um, and I didn't press F5 here. Sad. Give me one second. I have the wrong slides open. Okay, so um, here I'm building a tree on the breast cancer data set, which is a binary classification data set. Um, I do train test split, and then I build the decision tree. Um, I say the maximum depth should be two, which says only do two iterations of the recursive splitting, basically. <laughs> and um, then I can use Okay, this is the wrong import. When I made the slide, I didn't, so I, I had, didn't have this feature uh, added to master. Um, so now this is in the, actually this is in the release zero, uh, zero to 20. When I made the slides, it wasn't in the release yet. But so this is in um, sklearn.tree.export. There's a function called plot tree. And um, you can just call this function plot tree on your decision tree classifier 
and will give you like a plot like this. Usually you want to pass the feature names so you can have um, some more semantic names here about what the thresholds mean. So here, um, the feature is basically always the feature. So you have the feature names here. So the most important or the most informative split that was uh, found at the top is worst perimeter is less equal to uh, 106.1. You also get some additional information. You can turn on more or less information if you want. Um, so here, entropy is in this um, case our um, uh, our impurity criterion, so we want to find the splits that decrease entropy as much as possible, and you can see how the uh, entropy decreases as you go down the tree, and the value is the number of samples which, of each class in the leaves. For splits, is it always in the format of less or equal to, more equal to, or can it be more complex splits where it's multiple Okay, the question is, are the splits always of, of this form? And so in the most commonly used uh, kind of trees, yes, the question is always is a single threshold on a single feature. There's something called, uh, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, oblige, oh, I don't know. My uh, English pronunciation fails me, but uh, there's trees that um, allow linear functions. Um, you can have even um, you could have a neural network in each node if you really want to, uh, but they haven't been found to be very effective in practice if you allow more complex splits. Particularly, these splits are very, very fast to compute, so this is what's co most commonly used in practice. Uh, the case of entropy, is it node-specific or is it for the model? Because here, there's actually an increase in entropy when the split happens on the left-hand side, the third level. Yes, ah, so here the entropy um, is normalized in the node. So basically you want to compare the weighted sum of the entropies weighted by the number of samples in the, um, in the leaves. So here uh, this, le this leaf uh, or this node got, got less pure, but this got much more pure. And um, basically there's more samples here. And so uh, you care more about this. So it's node specific, but if you compare splits, you look at um, the total entropy after the splitting, and the total entropy is uh, weighted by the number of samples. I mean, no, the, um, so the question is, if I can just create a node that's relatively pure, will I do that? Or, I mean, you can compute the numbers. And uh, no, the, the, the uh, entropy balances between, like tries to make both leaves as pure as possible. And so but this is a split that maximizes this criterion. To make both nodes as pure. Yes. To make, Yes, it makes both new nodes as pure as possible, um, not just one of them. So, so you can imagine that, um, let's say I sp from here there's like one of one class and um, one from the other, uh, and there's 200 something from the other class, and if I could split off this one point together with one of the other class, this might be a good thing to do, right? If I can separate, then the other one would be pure. So if I have, then I have uh, 237 of one class in one leaf and like one of each in the other leaf. That might like, um, that might not be too bad, but this means the leaf that has one of each has um, an entropy of 0.5, which is like the highest possible. And, um, but you don't care so much uh, in the overall weighting uh, because you created a very pure leaf. But it's not doing one or the other. You have this numeric criterion that tries to make everything as pure as possible. The node on the uh, last here and the node on the uh, last of the right side, I'm just 
just looking at samples 130 and 2 have been classified right is that the right way of giving sorry uh, can you say this again say for example the the value column uh, left side last is 1 239 1 comma 239 the value 1 comma 2 oh yeah yeah uh, and i'm just looking at the entropy value here yes it's 0 0.008 and when we go to the uh, node at the last column that's 128 comma 2 and the entropy is 0.03 is there any uh, correlation as to how it's finding entropy in these cases I'm not sure if I understand. I mean, so if, if the leaf is pure, then the entropy is zero. If the leaf is 50-50, then the entropy is 0.5. And so, yeah, so yes, it is related to basically how much do you misclassify if you um, predict the, the majority. <coughs> yes, it is related to that. I mean, I guess this is slightly more uh, obvious in the regression case where it's exactly that. For mean squared error, it's like, what is the error after I predict with this? And here, um, as I said, uh, last time in the linear models, basically just doing the error in classification is kind of bad, so you need to kind of smooth it over. And so um, the entropy is basic, or the genetic index are two ways to smooth it over. All right. So, as I already said, these are very prone to overfitting. And so, um, there's a bunch of parameters we can tune to um, avoid overfitting or limit the complexity of the trees. There's two basic methods, which is pre pruning and post pruning. Uh, pre pruning means uh, we just basically stop the growth of the tree. Post pruning means we grow a very deep tree and then we prune it back to a nicer shape. The post pruning is not in scikit-learn right now. Um, one of my, um, I guess, one of my uh, software developers is working on it. Um, it's actually not that hard, but uh, because uh, single trees, as I'll come to in a, in a little bit, single trees are not very good for prediction. And so these are actually not used like if you want a good predictive model as much, and so we don't really care that much about post pruning, and so it hasn't been implemented. If you care about uh, something interpretable, then having a single post pruned tree might be nice because it gives you like a compact representation. All right, but let's say we want to do pre pruning, which means limit the tree size while uh, you're building the tree. And there's a bunch of different criteria. So you can do maximum depth of the tree, maximum number of leaf nodes. Um, what a leaf nodes is when you build in a depth, in the best first uh, fashion. So you always split the thing that gives you the, the node next, that gives you the best uh, decrease in entropy. Min sample split says um, stop splitting after a node has this many, uh, this many samples left. Min impurity decrease says um, only split if you can decrease the impurity by this much. And so usually people pick one or maybe two of these criteria and then grid search them or um, set them by some heuristic. So on this breast cancer data set, which is like a pretty small data set, um, I'm going to show you how these will play out. So here, this is uh, no pruning, and um, so it's because it's a relatively small data set, it's not so deep. It's like one, two, three, four, five levels deep. And uh, if you have, and this is already a sort of maybe a little bit hard to conceptualize, like you could print this out and give it to your boss, but I don't know if he would be very happy with this. If you, and this is, um, this data set has what, uh, 500 samples. So you can imagine if you have a data set with um, 5,000 samples or 100,000 samples, uh, these things will already become very massive and you can't really look at them anymore. At least if you build them completely. 
And you can see here, if you look at the different splits, um, like some of the um, nodes have a lot of data points. Like most of the data points are, I think, either in this leaf or in this leaf. Um, so most of the class of the second class is here. Most of the first class is here. And then there's like a whole bunch of things going on in the center. And you can see there's lots of leaves that have just a single data point in them. They just have a single data point in them. You probably don't expect them to generalize very well. So uh, maybe one, uh, one other note is, so if we can also use these trees to predict probabilities by predicting the, pro the fraction of um, samples in a given class. So if I asked the, t the tree for a data point that ends up in here, how certain is it that it's class one? It will tell me it's 100% certain because uh, all of the samples in this leaf are class one. Probably it shouldn't be that certain because there's only one sample. So if you used uh, the number of samples in each class as a way to estimate probability, if you don't, if you don't prune the tree because you keep doing it until every leaf is pure, you will always be 100% sure, no matter what you predict. So this, this notion of uncertainty only makes sense if you limit the growth of the tree. Because yeah, a probability estimate that's always like 100% or 0% is not really that helpful. All right, so one way to pre-prune the, uh, pre the tree is setting the maximum depth. So here we can see we limit it to four. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Um, there's still a, uh, quite a lot of leaves and quite a lot of them are quite small, but generally this is maybe more interpretable. Um, max leaf nodes gives you a tree of depth one, two, three, four, five, but actually it's quite a bit smaller than the uh, max depth four one and you have less leaves, um, yeah, less leaves than with the max depth four, I think. You also don't have any um, leaves with a single data point, uh, which I didn't really, like, which I don't really like having a single data points. Finally, here's min sample split. I mean, there, there, this is actually not an exhaustive list. I think there's like five or six ways to do pre-pruning in scikit-learn, and they might give you different results. Uh, I just want to show you these to give you sort of a flavor. Um, yeah, usually you just pick one or one of them and grid search it and um, sort of call it a day. Uh, so here, min sample split basically says, stop splitting after you reach this. And so, um, for example, here, there's a node that has only 19 samples. So even though it's very impure, this will not be split anymore. Here, this has 37 samples. So even, it's, even though it's very impure, it's um, not split anymore. Here, this is actually already very pure, but it has lots of samples in it. So we're going to split off uh, a single data point. There's also an alternative way to implement this, where basically you say, um, we on, I only want to create leaves if there's at least that many data points. Um, but that's uh, slightly different. So let's say we um, pick one of the, um, let's say max depth, and then we do a grid search. So here I use max depth from one to seven. One of the things that I find a little bit tricky about trees is find the right ranges uh, to grid search over because they sort of depend on the complexity of the data set and on the number of samples. So um, clearly the depth needs to be smaller than, I think, wait, two times the number of samples, but that's like a very 
course bound. And so if you have a thousand samples, you probably don't want um, a depth of 500, but uh, what depths you actually want, I find it a little bit hard to, um, hard to uh, figure out. So here I have a depth from one to seven. So usually I just uh, do so, uh, try some ranges and look at the graphs and look at the results. And you can see that here it, with depth one, two, and three, I'm kind of underfitting a little bit. And with um, four and five, I get better results. And then if I go from five to six, I guess there's like a small decrease. So uh, we might say five is the optimum depth. If I do max leaf nodes, um, this I find a little bit even harder to set, but um, it often gives like very nice small trees. So here you can see again that with uh, two, four, six, the model is maybe a little bit too simple. You get actually quite a decent result for eight and then not a lot changes anymore. You don't really see it overfitting a lot, but if I have the choice between having a, a tree with uh, eight leaves and with 18 leaves, if they give me about the same uh, performance, I would always pick the most simple model that gives me a good performance. I mean, that's like a general principle. Uh, I always want the simplest model that works well for me because it is like, even though I can't really measure if it overfit or not, um, it's less likely to overfit. The question is, um, if you pick more than one option, can you uh, use them at the same time? And the answer is yes, some of them you can. Um, I think, yeah, there, there was a bug filed like last week. Uh, but that's not, it's more a documentation bug. Uh, if you use max depth, no, sorry, if you use max leave nodes, max depth gets ignored of the way it's implemented. Um, but generally you can pick uh, multiple of these and um, like min sample split, you can combine with any of the other ones, for example, and you can search both of them. And basically the, it will only keep splitting if all of them are satisfied. So I want to uh, take a quick moment and relate how trees work to how nearest neighbors work. Because they're actually very related if you look at the analysis and the theory. So basically both of these predict the average of their neighbors or the majority vote of their neighbors. And, either, and uh, the neighbors are either in k nearest neighbor determined by the distance and k, um, or in the case of the trees, the neighbors are everything that end up in the same leaf. Clearly the, the leaves are not sort of random, so the leaves are determined by um, how the splitting algorithm works, but in a sense they um, sort of work quite similar. One of the benefits of the trees are that they are much, much faster to predict because you have this tree data structure. You can just traverse the tree, which is very quickly. For nearest neighbor, you had to compute basically all the different uh, distances between all points or the distance from a test point to all training points. But one thing they have in common is that because they predict the average of some neighbors, they can't extrapolate. And I want to illustrate this with a small example. So this is the price of uh, RAM of memory in dollars per megabyte. And this is sort of a kind of Moore's law kind of uh, behavior. So this is our logarithmic axis. And you can see on this logarithmic axis, uh, this is pretty much a straight line. So there's an exponential decrease in how much RAM costs. 
So now, let's say I want to uh, fit a model to this, and let's say I look at the data up to 2000, and then I want to see what will the model tell me what happens in the future. So here, I, um, the black is the training data, the blue is the test data, um, green is a linear model on the logarithmic data, basically it's saying, uh, yeah, I just fit a line, and then orange, there's a tree. So here, I limited the depth of the tree. So um, if I didn't limit the depth of a regression tree, it would just perfectly fit the line. But to illustrate it, I, um, or I mean, it's generally a good idea. I uh, limited the depth to a tree. And so you can see it's a piecewise constant function. So here, all the points here on the x-axis, they all fall on the same leaf. And so they all get the same prediction, which is the average in this leaf. Here's another leaf, and everything um, in this interval f falls in the same leaf, so they all get the prediction, which is the average, and so on. Okay, so any guess what the linear model does on the test set? Yes, the answer is this. <laughs> um, it just goes straight ahead. Uh, or stra sorry, st continues straight down. Any idea what the um, tree model will do? Yes, the tree model goes straight to the right. Uh, so the reason why this happens is if you want to predict here, it looks at to which leaf does it fall into. And the leaf is clearly this guy over here. Because this is the closest they have I've seen in the training set, so this is the leaf. So I'll predict the average of this leaf. There is no way to predict something like 10 to the minus 1, because it never saw this in the training data set. So there is no way it could ever predict this, because it predicts averages of what it saw in the training data set. This is not really an issue in practice because usually you don't want it to extrapolate. And you can definitely do time series like this with trees by reformulating the problem. But you should just keep in mind that you can never predict anything that's not in the training set. And you will actually basically shrink the things because you predict averages. So as you see here, the tree never predicts the most extreme values. It never predicts this value and it never predicts this value because it computes averages. And yeah, so in practice this is not really a concern, but thinking about trees, I think this helps you um, visualize what's happening. There's another issue in practice that's um, much more of an issue with trees, which is instability. So here I um, built a tree on the iris data set, on the left and on the right. And so on the left, I did the train test split with random state zero. And on the right, I did the train test split with random state one. And you see, even the topmost split is different. These trees are completely different. And uh, so that's maybe not very satisfying. If you, so if you say, oh, this is interpretable, I can print it out and give it to my boss. But, uh, but then if you split the data set slightly different, you get a completely different printout. What does this tell you about the algorithm? It's kind of funny. So this slide has been on this uh, deck for three years. But uh, I think last week, someone sent me an email as a response to my book. I changed the random seat. Now my tree is completely different. Uh, why is that? That's because trees. Trees are just like that. Um, so here in this case, there was actually a tie. So these two have basically have uh, very similar um, values. So this one does like 37, 37, 38. And this one does 38, 37, 37. All right. And so if you just change something very slightly about the data set, you might get a completely different tree. This is something that's called, um, often called variance of an estimator, which I'll come back to in, in a minute. 
And basically you're saying, if I assume I sample the data set again from the same distribution, how much will my model change? And here, what I'm saying is basically, okay, if I split the data set differently, that's similar to sampling a new data set from the same distribution. And if I do that, I would expect, if this was a very stable model, I would expect to get exactly the same outcome. But in fact, I get a completely different outcome, meaning the model is very unstable, and if I collect new data, or if I basically draw new, new data from the same distribution, I will get a completely different model. This is the main reason why people don't like to use trees that much in practice. Okay, the question is, um, the trees might be very different, but are the predictions very different? And the answer is, it depends. I'll show you cases, so they can be very different. Um, I actually, I don't have a visualization for this. I probably should uh, at this point. I'll show you one later. So, um, okay, maybe I can go back to a visualization I showed earlier. Like, so here, for this plot, imagine I split horizontally instead of vertically here, then I would have very different predictions here, and I would have very different predictions here. So there can be areas where there's very different predictions. The areas where there's a lot of training data, um, they, they probably will have the same predictions. But like, basically the areas where it's overfitting, they will be different. Um, okay, so the question is, if I limit the complexity of the tree, will, um, will this be less bad? So will the uh, predictions of the trees be more similar? And the answer is yes. If you limit the complexity of the tree, it will overfit less, and so um, it will be more stable. But it will also be like most likely a worse predictor in the sense that you didn't, because you have a more simple model, it might underfit more. But that's definitely one way to combat this. Uh, one thing I only briefly want to mention here is that you can compute uh, feature importances, which is basically says how often did, we, did the tree split on a feature and how much did it decrease the impurity. If you have very deep trees, it might be very hard to understand what's happening in the tree. And the feature importance is something, it's a vector of the length of number of features. It tells you how important did the model think these features were, and it's a way to introspect and debug your model. I think actually next week we will talk, have a whole lecture about model debugging. And um, so we'll talk about other measures there. One issue with this here is though, I said each tree is very unstable. And so if there are very correlated features, which feature is picked is basically random. And so just because a particular tree gave very strong importance to something, or sorry, let's, let me say it the other way around. Even though this tree gave no importance at all to these two features, it doesn't mean they're uninformative. This doesn't mean this tree picked these features. If I resample and I build another tree, it could be that the tree picked these features. So the feature importances are a way to understand what's happening in the tree, but for a single tree, they're very unstable as the tree is itself. So, A uh, brief remark on categorical data. So trees are one of the few models that can work with categorical data directly. And um, the most common thing is like, let's say I have, uh, I don't know, K categories. I'm gonna split them into two sets of categories. That's sort of the most um, common way to, or the most intuitive way to do this. The problem 
problem is though there's true to the number of category many ways to do this. Like splitting a set into two, there's very many options in how, how you can split a set into two. It's actually possible to do this in linear time exactly um, for Gini index in binary classification and also for regression. It's um, not possible to do this exactly for multi-class classification, but you can do this using some heuristics. Unfortunately, this is not in scikit-learn right now. If you use trees or forest in R, they can do that. Uh, scikit-learn will hopefully be able to do that pretty soon. Um, but scikit-learn generally is like a little bit tricky to deal with categorical data because scikit-learn operates mostly on NumPy arrays, and NumPy arrays all have the same type. So if you have a tree, the input to the tree will be a float array. And so you would need to tell him which of the floats are categorical if you want special treatment for categorical data. But it's kind of neat that you, can, you don't have to do one hot encoding here. Uh, in principle, you can have the, the tree deal with it uh, directly. And so you, in second learn, you have to do one hot encoding right now. And so this might lead to different trees and deeper trees. Because if you do one hot encoding, Basically, if you want to like, have 10 categories and you want to split it 5-5, five, five, you need to do five splits in scikit-learn with one hot encoding, whereas you could do it in one split if you had real categorical splits. And there are some people that try to sell their products for having their fast tree implementation and say it's a very bad thing. It's like this in scikit-learn. Um, I don't think in practice it makes that big a difference, um, but yeah, it's not ideal to do one-hot encoding. It's probably going to be fine. Oh, yeah. So um, I already talked about breaking probability. So you can break the fraction of, leaf, uh, of a class in a leaf. And without pruning, you're always 100% certain. Even with pruning, you might be too certain. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention there's uh, actually a, a quite nice uh, newer version of trees called conditional inference trees, which um, select the best split correcting for multiple hypothesis testing errors. And um, they also deal better with a mixture of categorical and continuous data. Uh, it's, there's an implementation in R called party. There is no implementation in Python that I'm aware of. Um, but you can, yeah. So if you want to use this, use R maybe, or use R from Python, or implement it and send a pull request. It's the best, best option. Um, so I briefly touched about uh, different splitting methods. So um, trees are, in a sense, kind of similar uh, to um, kernels. They're kind of cool because you can apply them to any data if you think about it in the right way. So here this image is um, from the Kinect. So this is maybe, who here knows what a Kinect is? Okay, uh, so it's maybe a little bit retro by now. So uh, Microsoft had a thing for the X Xbox which could track your body using um, a depth sensor. And um, so basically it wanted to, so this is the software behind the depth tracking that they used eight years ago. Now they're probably using deep neural nets. Um, but then the hardware wasn't fast enough for that. And so they used uh, decision trees. And so they wanted to figure out, OK, if I have this depth images, where's the head, where's the hands, and so on. And instead of um, basically converting this to a feature vector, you can directly ask questions on the image. So basically they ask, OK, if I want to classify this point, um, I can ask, is this point deeper, uh, like further away or closer to the camera than the point above it? Or if I want to classify this point, if I look left and right, is left deeper than right or not? So um, basically, you can do anything in any node that you want. Um, as long as you can come up with any kind of question, uh, yes, no question, you can build a tree based on the yes, no questions. 
And so this is, you can do this on float data, as I said, you could try to build a linear model in each node. Um, in practice, people haven't found this to be super useful except for very specific applications. But if your data is structured in some way, like these depth images are, you can use the 2D structure of the image and um, uh, basically ask questions about these two, this 2D structure, or in this case, 2D plus depth structure of the image. And so uh, before neural nets, uh, these kind of um, tree-based models were actually doing very, very well on images, and they need um, somewhat less strain data. All right, so now we talked enough about trees. So now I'll give you the actual method, um, how to fix the issues of um, trees having high variance, which is ensemble methods. Ensemble methods basically just mean use multiple models and mesh them together in some way. And um, the main idea is if I have multiple models and if they make different mistakes, if I average them, they will basically cancel out each other's mistakes. There's some um, uh, simple tricks to do this, what I call poor, uh, poor man ensembles that people use, for example, to win competitions is just, uh, actually, if you look at how people win ImageNet competitions or Kaggle competitions, they build the same model, they pick the random seed differently, and then they average all the models. Because um, here, so for example, for XGBoost, um, it's very common to build five XGBoost models with a different random state. They make all slightly different mistakes. So if you average them, it's better. Similar for convolutional neural networks and ImageNet people. Um, I think I don't know if it's probably still true that the winner is usually um, you f find some architecture or maybe slightly different architectures. You build models and you average them, and it's going to be better. Um, yeah, and you can basically always average models as long as they provide some way of, to. Um, either have voting or have probabilities. So usually, you want them to break probabilities and you average the probabilities. If the probabilities are completely off, then you can't do anything. So are all models can be averaged? I mean, you can, yes, you can average all models. I mean, basically, the, the idea is build a model, it gives you some probabilities. Build another model, it also gives you some probabilities, average the probabilities. That's, that's the... Uh, that's an ensemble of two models that you just average. Average the results of the models. Yeah, average the predictions. Average the predictions of the models. So you would require to rerun all the models over and over again every time you want to implement your, your model, bigger model, or something like that, or like a right? So every time I want to make a prediction, I have to run each of the model, take the output of each of the model, average their prediction vectors, and that's my prediction. And so this is actually not like, building multiple neural nets, so building multiple XGBoost models and then averaging them. That's not really something that's done a lot in practice, but it's if you want to squeeze out the really, really last bit uh, and, or win a competition, that's what you have to do. You can do this pretty easily in scikit-learn with the voting classifier. So here's like um, a kind of silly example of doing this. This is not something I want, would do in practice, but something to just illustrate uh, how you might do, go about doing this. So here, I take a voting classifier, which just averages the probabilities between a logistic regression model and the decision tree classifier. And so here, I b this is the logistic regression model uh, fit on this uh, this two class uh, two class classification problem. This is the decision tree. They work very differently. They model different things, and I can just take the average and the average prediction is just um, the, uh, yeah, the average of the probability. So basically, it's just the two pictures averaged. Here in this case, um, the average does better. So here, voting.score is the score of the average. And uh, these other two, this is the score of just the 
a logistic regression model. This is the score of just the test, the decision tree model. All right, so this is sort of, if I have multiple models, I can average them. And if the errors they make are uncorrelated, it gets better. Basically, each, each of them is better than chance, and they make different mistakes. Averaging them makes it better. <coughs> so how do I, do I make sure that my models are, make different mistakes? So as I said, you can sort of tune the random state, but it will only change the model very little. Um, if you want to change the model more, one way to do this is what's called bagging, which stands for bootstrap aggregation. And basically the way, he, the idea here is to uh, do a bootstrap sample of your data set, which means if this is your data set, you create new data sets where you sample with replacement new data points um, until you have as much as the original data set. So here, say I have five data points, I, I sample with replacement a new data set, it also has five data points. And um, some of them will be missing and some of them will be duplicated. Now I built a model on this data set and on this data set and um, then I can average them and I know because they're built on different data sets, the models will be different. And so you might do this not only twice, but you might do this 100 times. You get 100 models that are slightly different. And um, averaging them will hopefully give you a better model. So the idea this relates to um, is often discussed in terms of bias and variance, which is going back to what I talked about um, with overfitting trees. So, as I said, trees are called high variance, which means that if you change the data set a little bit, then you will get a very different model. This is sort of, let's see, a red is the real model, and you change your data set a little bit, you get one of the trees, and they're all different. So if you, if you average them, you will get something that is lower variance. And so if you average these points all together, you will get something that is closer to the center. Uh, bias, on the other hand, means the model that um, is sort of not good on average. This could be a model that's too simple. Say if I have a nonlinear, um, or I have a not linearly separable problem, I use a linear classifier, uh, then a linear model will always do bad because it can't really model um, what's happening. And so the idea is that if we have something that's generally, it's good on average, but has high variance, we can use things like ensembles, things like bagging, to decrease the variance and we'll get good models. And trees are, of course, the main candidate for this, the trees will be able to fit the data set very well because they're non-parametric models. We can make them arbitrary complex, but they will be very different each time. So averaging them makes sense. So, um, yeah, Breiman is the guy who invented uh, random forests, which is obviously what this leads up to. And he showed basically, um, if you do ensembles, the um, generalization strength of the ensemble is, um, depends on the strength of the individual classifiers. So if all your individual classifiers are good, clearly the average will be good. And their correlation. So if all of them are the same, clearly averaging them is not going to help. But if they have um, uncorrelated errors, averaging them helps. But so what this the insight he had is that maybe it doesn't matter if we make them slightly worse if we make them uncorrelated. And so this is a little bit the idea behind the bagging. So in the bagging, for each model, I don't use the whole data set. So it's probably worse than if I use the whole data set. But it allows me to make different, many different models. And so having this difference on average, makes up for the fact that each model is maybe a little bit weaker. All 
All right, so here is an illustration of the random forest. Um, in the random forest, you build many trees, uh, usually hundreds or thousands, and you average them, and the average will be your prediction. This answers a little bit the question like, um, well, if I resample a data set, won't the predictions be the same? And here you can see that um, depending on which tree you pick, the predictions might actually be quite different in different parts of the data set. So this tree and this tree, they make very different predictions in this part of the data set here. If you limit the complexity, they might be more similar, but then basically they will, by uh, limiting the complexity, you will have bias. Uh, yeah? Sorry, but then in this case, all of the random forest is sometimes a very uh, strong or green quality. Because it seems that it's all the, like the, the points there, so the, the result is not really. OK, the question is, will the random forest overfit? And so the point is that basically each of these trees are overfit. Um, like, but they're all overfit in some different way, in a different way. And so the goal is if you have enough trees, um, the random forest will not overfit because it averages out the overfitting. In this example, I only used four trees because that's the side of my slide. And so this looks very much like, the other, like these uh, other predictions. Also, I'm, put, I'm plotting here the predictions, not the probabilities. If I used... Um, many more trees, this would be a little bit smoother. Um, but because all of them are like axis parallel, they, they will have like these edges. So, but um, in general, this will, I mean, if you look at this, this looks way less overfit than this, right? Um, this basically, maybe this area appears a little bit weird, but uh, generally this um, does a pretty good job of capturing the data set. And so basically the idea is the random forest will not overfit because it's the average of lots of trees that all overfit in different ways. All right, so how do we make them overfit in different ways? We already talked about um, bootstrapping um, or bagging. Um, there's another uh, trick that random forests uh, use. So, I mean, for each tree, what you do is first you pick a bootstrap sample of the data, as you do with like general bagging. But then there's another um, randomization step where uh, for each split, every time you want to um, create a new node, you pick a random sample of the features. So you, um, let's say this is your data set, and then for each, uh, let's say, okay, I wanna do my first split, you pick a subset of the features and you allow only a best split on these features. This will make this tree usually much deeper, or if you limit the depth, it will be sort of a weaker predictor. But it will make sure that you inject randomness, and the randomness allows the trees to be less correlated. So basically, you're um, injecting randomness and noise into the trees in these two different ways. And, uh, each individual tree might not be a very strong predictor, in particular since you in injected noise in this way, but if you have, the more trees you add, the better it gets. At some point, there's usually diminishing returns, but uh, you won't get worse by adding more trees, because you're, if you add more trees, you average more. Um, does that have any implications for uh, the interpretability of um, feature importances, because we've seen before that sometimes the features outcompete each other if they are highly correlated. And here you have uh, maybe situations where you randomly pick uh, some of the features while not picking correlated features. So, what implication would, would that have for the, the question? Is what's the implication for feature importances? And that's two slides away. And so, patience. Um, maybe it's more than two slides. It's not far, though. So, um, yeah, so the main, so one of the parameters is the number of trees. That's not really something you tune or grid search, because more is always better. So if I run 
So there's no point in running a tree, a, a forest with 50 trees, and then running a forest with 100 trees. If you have that much time, run one with 150 trees, and it will be better. The main tuning parameter is max features, which says how many features should I pick um, for each split. And um, a general guideline and the default in scikit-learn is for classification, you take the square root of number of features. So if you have 64 features in your data set, in each node you only consider a random subset of eight of them. But then you consider all possible thresholds on these eight features and you pick the best one. Um, for regression, actually, the, re uh, the recommendation is the number of features. Um, if you, and the default is a number of features, which means basically you're not doing the subsetting by default. So by default, you're using all features in every split, but this uh, might still be a good thing to tune and see if, if you use less features, you might uh, get better predictions. The number of estimators right now is 10 for, let's say, historical reasons, but we're going to be changing it to uh, 100 in uh, 0 0.22 but generally you want hundreds or thousands. So in practice, um, yeah, having like several thousand trees is not uncommon. Using pre-pruning might help with the modeling, but it will definitely help with the model size. As I said, these models, like, because you put a bunch of randomness in the feature selection, they can get very deep, and they can get, if you have thousands of them, excuse me, uh, they can get very big in memory. So if you limit the depth or the number of leaf nodes, um, the training can be much faster and the resulting model can be much smaller. So let me think the max depth may just run it fa uh, make it run faster. And yeah, in some cases it might also make the model uh, better. I'm not sure entirely if I understand the question. Um, so there's a so the question was about the connection between end features and max depth. So max depth is how many questions can you ask in a row, and max features is how many features you allow in each uh, node, which are randomly drawn. If you only allow a subset, you will get usually get deeper trees because you don't get an ideal the ideal feature because you might not be allowed to use the ideal feature. But also, you might never be allowed to use the ideal feature if you're unlucky in your random sampling. Okay, the question is, uh, in terms of compromise between, um, well, if I have limited time or uh, memory, would you do less deep trees or more shallow trees? The answer is I would do a gradient boosting, which we do next week, no, Wednesday. But um, for random forest, I think um, I probably would do more shallow trees, maybe. Um, yeah, I think basically having few trees, if you have less than 100 trees, I wouldn't bother. Um, and um, you can, um, I mean, you can, there's never like the one true answer, and you can always like search over the, it, right? So you can try both and pick the better one. Um, I will also talk about something in a second where you basically, you can add more and more trees to a, an existing forest. You can see, does it get any better? And if you feel, if it stops getting better, just stop adding trees. Was there another question? Um, there's another variant that is um, 
The name is not as well known, but it's actually a technique that's quite well, quite commonly used, um, which is called extremely randomized trees or extra trees. And they're in a, dif in a different class in, in scikit-learn. Um, and the idea is basically just inject more randomness, but in a different way. It does away with the bootstrap sampling, so you, you or in the paper that published that, they didn't use the bootstrap sampling. And, um, but instead, you um, randomly draw the threshold for each feature. So you still, for each node, you look at, uh, you sample a subset of the features. For each of feature in the subset, you sample a random threshold, and then you pick the best one of them. So this basically injects a whole lot more randomness because um, usually you search over all best thresholds and you have like basically much more choice than if you just have one possible threshold per feature that you sampled. It's faster building the individual tree because you don't need, need, no, you don't see, need searching, sorting of the features or doing the searching for the best threshold. Um, but you usually need uh, more trees or deeper trees. And so it's not necessarily faster in practice, but it can give you smoother boundaries because you can't pick the best threshold and it gives you just sort of more fuzzy boundaries. All right, so as I said, you can, um, add trees to an uh, existing forest. You can't really do this in, within a grid search, but um, if you just want to evaluate, so, okay, let's say I have li uh, limited uh, patience, and so I want to know how many trees do I really need. There's the warm start parameter in the random forest, and the way it works is that um, you can set warm start equal to true, so by default it starts, this is the old default, starts with 10 uh, trees, Oh, actually, I'm, I'm starting with, am I starting with one? Yeah, I'm starting with one tree. Um, I set random forest dot n estimators to an estimator. So here, this is, it starts with one. Then I fit, uh, this will um, add trees to the forest until it has enough estimators. So here in the first iteration, we'll just it fit one tree. The next iteration, I take the same forest and um, I set an estimators to six, and then it'll add five more trees. And so in each iteration, it will add five more trees to the existing random forest. And so here, I can get a curve uh, that shows me, wow, one of these is supposed to be the test score. Um, blue as the test score, or validation, yeah, it's the test score. And um, so basically, uh, it tells me that after, I don't know, maybe 60 or something, not a lot happens anymore, and maybe I don't need to add more trees. Um, so here the thing is that warm start is like kind of a weird trick because usually if you call fit, it forgets, the model forgets anything that happened previously and resets it completely. If you set warm stock equal to true, it'll just keep adding to the model that you already built. That would also be possible with the grid search, right? I could also combine warm start with the grid search. You can't combine warm start with grid search right now. Um, what you could do is uh, search over, like always doubling the number of estimators and then searching over it will only take twice as long as computing the most expensive one. But, well, whatever. Um, but this is sort of, if you're really concerned about budget, you can run this and you can see um, how many trees do I really need. Another cool thing you can do with, uh, with random forest is what's called out of bag estimates. Um, I haven't used, I, they're not that commonly used, but it's kind of a, a neat thing to uh, know about. And the trick is that using this bootstrap sampling, or anytime you do um, bagging, 
you only use 66% of the data on average. Because you sample with replacement, as I said, you leave some of the data points out, and you double some up. That means um, yeah, each, each tree only uses about 2 thirds of the data set. That means you can evaluate the tree on these other um, one th on the remaining one third, and this is called the out of bag estimate. And so basically, you can get away without using uh, a validation set and use this out of uh, out of bag estimate instead. And you can use more data to train your model because you don't have to set aside a validation set. It's a little bit weird to understand this because each prediction is an average over a different subset of trees. So basically, to evaluate this, you take your training set, and for each point in the training set, you look, what are the trees that didn't use this training set? What are the trees where the bootstrap sample didn't include this training set? Then I use all of these trees to make a prediction, and that's my prediction for this training point. But if I do this, I'll get an unbiased estimate of um, my holdout performance, and um, yeah, basically I get away without using a validation set. Here is a comparison on like train scores. So basically I'm, uh, I'm trying to do something like grid search, but I used out of back instead of using a validation set um, for max features. And okay, I don't know if they show the same trend. On average, they show the same trend. Uh, there's probably a lot of noise in this process because I did it on a small data set. Um, so now coming to the earlier question about variable importance. Oh, I'm two minutes over time, but this is the last slide. Um, so generally, I would trust the very imp variable importance more in a random forest because it's likely that if a feature is important, then it got picked by one of the trees because um, if there's like correlated features, sometimes the random sampling will pick one and sometimes it will pick the other one. And so the results from this will be much smoother um, than what you get from just using a single tree. So this is more robust than using a single tree for feature importances. Um, but we're actually going to talk about an even better way to do this um, in a week or so. This is still not super great because it uses the training set properties. So it uses the training set to evaluate the model uh, because it asks how important were these features on the training set. And so th that can give you like some, some biased answers. All right, that's it. Thanks. Oh, uh, we all publish the scores for the homework one today, unless they, have, they might have been released just now. Um, you can look on, at them on Gradescope. And yeah, homework two is due on Wednesday at 1 p.m.